Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to welcome you to the happy hour, launching right in with a Living History talk by Johan Paulsen. What an honor and what a treat to have Johan in the series. Um, without further ado, please take it away, Johan. Well, thank you, Sri, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so when uh, Sri asked me to do this, I asked if she wants to science or family stuff. And uh, you mentioned that um, you want to hear a bit about sort of background and personal background and sort of unusual paths to, to science. I just want to start a little bit, but uh, growing up, I grew up in Sweden in a small industrial town. Um, my mother was uh, fairly interested in culture. My dad was more outdoorsy. Um, I'd say that the, in terms of getting um, encouragements and support, the schools pretty much did nothing until I was 15, I'd say. Uh, I looked for a picture of my actual school and I didn't mean to make it bleak, but uh, this is the actual, actual picture. Um, so most of my childhood was just, my dad was this uh, fanatic sort of polar explorer. He read sort of Shackleton's books and um, was obsessed with snow and ice. So even though we lived in Sweden, every vacation was north. Uh, if it was extremely cold outside, like minus 30, then my dad always insisted that we sleep outside. Uh, so that was really fun and they were very supportive. Um, maybe the two happiest people I know and it's still, I'd say the, the few weeks I go there uh, uh, every year, maybe the happiest weeks of my year as well. Um, but they had no connections to science, no connection to research and there was nothing else in the, in the school system. So, so my first career attempt had nothing to do with science really. Um, I was a fanatic bird watcher growing up. Uh, and as a from teenager and young adult, I started working with that. So I spent seven years, three days a week, pulling out 10,000 pounds of roadkill and uh, dead animals for feeding eagles, um, working banding stations. And then more recently, I, I uh, also guided a little bit in Africa. Um, it's pretty hard to do bird watching uh, uh, professionally, though. There are very few people that get paid for it. Um, so then I tried some photography. I tried woodworking. Uh, but it wasn't really a, a good career, I guess. So, uh, so that didn't really work out. Um, my second attempt was more uh, towards philosophy and literature. So I, uh, at the college, I, I got a BA in philosophy. Uh, in Sweden, they have a distinction between theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. So a theoretical philosophy is more like ontologies uh, and mathematical logic and so forth. So that's why, why I focused on. Uh, and I started some, uh, some graduate work, uh, graduate courses, but I didn't really like the uh, class as much, to be honest. I didn't really like the culture. I think I had expectations that they weren't really living up to. So I decided to ditch that as well. And then uh, my fourth year in college, I decided to do a, a third career attempt, which um, was to become a, a professional hiker. So I sold all my stuff and I got a ticket to New Zealand. And I spent uh, a good part of the year there just uh, hiking and mountaineering. Um, and it was really, I mean, it was. It was national parks and beautiful, but the, the main purpose was also to be isolated. So I think that the biggest experience I got from there was I went on these very long trips where I was uh, out for a month and then I got food and I went out for a month. And because it was there winter time, and that meant that uh, I could go three weeks but without seeing a single airplane, hearing a single voice, not a single person around because uh, uh, the, many of the parks are, are close in the winter. Um, but then I tried to uh, stay there permanently and do this uh, for a living. And it turns out, uh, you get a visa, you have to get money or a job, so I get kicked out. Um, that didn't really work out. Uh, the other thing I have to say is that I think I had these romantic ideas uh, about uh, being there in the uh, isolation and so forth. Uh, what I found is that uh, if you really is no one around, there's nothing to do, uh, you get obsessed with small things. So I spent hours being obsessed with what I would eat that day. Um, so it wasn't really the, the kind of romantic experience entirely. It was the nature was great, but it wasn't really what I had I, I thought was going to happen. And then I visited uh, the Rosal Cottage nearby, and was uh, amused to learn that uh, in this tiny little cottage, he still paid a cleaner to come and pick up stuff and make his food and so forth. So I think if you want to muse over uh, over the solitude, you, you need somebody to, to take care of needless stuff. Um, so then the fourth career, which is kind of uh, actually, in parallel to all these things, I was always, um, for many years, interested in sort of biophysical questions. Uh, my mom started out uh, as a pianist, and she tried to get me to be a pianist. I had absolutely no talent for it. So my siblings played all these instruments, and I said, I'll, I'll play board games instead. Um, so I did sort of Dungeons and Dragons a little bit, but mostly like Risk-style complicated board games. 
Um, uh, and they were all kind of this complicated uh, behaviors from a few simple rules, partly uh, based on, uh, on chance. So that was kind of a mindset I was very interested in. And then just by coincidence in my school, I just came across this book, uh, Evolutionist Entropy. Can't really vouch for it academically. I, haven't, it was, I was 15 or something when I, when I found the book. So um, I don't think I understand much of it at the time either, uh, but I got very interested in it. So before I went to college, in Sweden, there are no uh, interviews. Uh, uh, you send your SATs, you send your grades to a central system, and they you just rank your, your choices, and they just tell you where you get in. Um, so I decided to uh, call around all the universities and see, is there anyone in Sweden that does research uh, on this topic? Is there any sort of statistical physics in biology uh, being done in Sweden? And it turned out that uh, Uppsala University uh, had essentially a few people, and there was very little elsewhere. Um, and then as uh, my first week as an, an undergrad, I walked in uh, to the office of Mons Ehrenberg that everybody had told me to, uh, to contact. Uh, and he became, uh, I think, more important for my science and encouragement and, and all the work I've done, maybe than everybody else put together in my, in my career. Um, so he signed me up for his graduate course on stochastic chemistry. And then I got involved in teaching that. I started working in his labs in the summers, and I did my both my undergrad, my master's, my PhD uh, with him. Um, and I probably spent at least an hour every day just talking to him. Uh, and 50 minutes of, of that hour probably was more like Monty Python style, uh, nonstop joking. Uh, and Mons is, a, is, a, is an incredible character. Uh, I probably shouldn't uh, retell any of those stories if it's going to be taped because they're not all appropriate. But uh, uh, it was a very, very uh, interesting experience and extremely, extremely interested in the science, extremely encouraging. Um, so I think that both the type of work I'm doing and my interest in science is really coming from, from one person. Um, um, just so you know, Johan, two minutes. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm doing, going slowly here. I also had support from two other Berg's uh, supervisors. I was uh, very sad today. I just learned today that Howard uh, passed away a few weeks ago. Um, uh, many of you uh, know him probably, uh, of him this book. Um, and that work really started with a lifelong uh, love story with stochastic chemistry, uh, looking at uh, chemical reactions in cells. Uh, in my department had uh, three out of four professors actually studied this, and there was no student or postdocs. There wasn't really much of a, a community. Um, so then I, I left for uh, Princeton to work with Stan Leibler. I did the maybe stupid sort of career choice of, uh, of just moving there without talking to him first. Uh, I just decided I'll just get a visa, I'll move there, and then I'll work out the, uh, if it works out in the lab or not. Um, so I did, and then it turns out that uh, pretty sh uh, soon thereafter, he actually left to uh, Rockefeller. Uh, and then I went to uh, Applied Math and Theoretical Physics in Cambridge, England to start my group. And uh, scientifically, uh, on the math side, what I've been mostly interested in the last 15 years are looking at generals and general rules and laws in biology, uh, especially in stochastic uh, chemistry. Um, and many think that there are no laws in biology. Everything is different. And we know that if we forget the feedback loop, if we don't know a parameter, uh, then you can go from an oscillatory system to bistable system or monostable system, whatever. So clearly all the details matter and we don't know the details. I think what people also forgetting that many laws of physics uh, are laws but what cannot happen. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics, it's not like ballistics where you say, this is exactly what will happen. It's broader statements, what cannot happen under, under a broad set of assumptions. Uh, and that is a well-posed question is where you can say, here's an infinite dimensional system. A few things in this system are specified, but you can get arbitrary input from, uh, uh, from everything else and feedback into everything else. And still there are certain things that are impossible. Uh, so that's kind of been my quest for many years is to figure that out. And for very simple systems, you can appreciate that a certain system cannot oscillate, for example. Uh, stochastic systems have the same thing. But the key thing here is that uh, now we can make statements for all parameters, all functions, all topologies, and you can really have sort of unknown unknowns everywhere. Um, and this was work I did a lot with uh, Glenn Vinicombe. Uh, it's also been incredibly important for my, my whole career. Um, since I'm running out of time here, I'm just going to quickly jump to um, another transition that I learned uh, uh, when I was in, in, in Stan's lab, Stan Leiter's lab, and that was start doing experiments myself. And I was always driven by individual questions. And maybe because I'm an applied mathematician, those questions could be all over the place. It doesn't have to be one particular system. But then in the last decade, I've also become sort of a born again Methodist in the sense that uh, I also really enjoy developing new biophysical methods. 
So one of the first ones we developed was taking an existing method actually from the LIBOR lab and then um, further developed by Sajun Yun and others uh, uh, just to see if we can track cells for very long periods of time. So here uh, cells we track for about 700 generations. So we can see how they switch into multicellular behavior and then switch out again. And if you look at the green period here, uh, it can be short intervals, can be long intervals, but the red ones are all kind of the same. So this uh, circuit manages to have a memoryless uh, one state and very, very tight memory in the other state. So uh, you could write down a very complicated model for this. I'm always in favor of a very simple model. So we just asked, uh, is it possible that uh, the simplest possible feature of the system that is known, two controllers just bind to each other and the complex does nothing. It just uh, sequesters away one of the components. Uh, this system is trivially monostable for all parameters. If you look at classical chemistry, but once you take stochastics into account, it turns out that you can get these uh, very distinct uh, on and off behaviors. And it turns out that when you analyze in more, in more depth, uh, this memorylessness in one state, the member in the other state, all these features that we can measure all come directly from the simplest possible model uh, of the system. Um, you don't have to tune any parameters. Uh, so, uh, we call it the Scrabble system because a very simple principle arises when we play uh, Scrabble with a number of vowels and constants. Um, so then uh, biologically, we then went in to uh, make sure that this is really the explanation because it's, it's one thing to have a simple explanation. It's another thing to have a simple correct explanation. Right? So uh, we went in and we took all this putative complexity, all these feedback loops, all these things that's supposed to control the circuit and we genetically knocked them out. And we found no change in the behaviors. So all these complicated things were supposed to do these things, they, they weren't. And then to address uh, my uh, reconstitution envy, I always love reconstitution experiments. Uh, it turns out we could reconstitute the whole thing uh, with two open reading things. So since then, we just pushed a lot on methods. We try to maximize precision and statistics for dynamics. We can now uh, look at lots of cell types. We can take out the cells. We also recently uh, gained the capacity to uh, genotype every single lineage on the chip. And we can do this in quite high throughput. So we can... Uh, uh, we can look at uh, over a million different lineages and they can be a million different mutants. So the idea here is to essentially take the in-depth precision of sort of biophysics style imaging and then sort of merge it with omics like approaches where we can actually uh, look more broadly. So uh, okay, last slide. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to, since this is supposed to be some general advice as well, I just want to put a few statements up there that uh, sound touristic almost, uh, but I just deeply disagree with. Uh, I think there are tons of uh, general laws for biological dynamics, and uh, we we've, it, it, we don't find one that often, but certainly uh, there are lots of them. One advice that a lot of people uh, hear uh, in our graduate program when they start out um, in biophysics is that it's so easy to find something that's important, it's easy to find something that's feasible, and what you should do is finding uh, something that's both feasible and important. And I think this is something that a lot of people do, they try to carve out something that sounds reasonable. And, I think that feasibility is incredibly hard to judge. There are many things we think are a bit trivial and they're super hard. There are many things we think are gonna be impossible. And once you start trying, it turns out that it's not really that impossible. Uh, so I'd say only worry about important. Don't worry about if it's feasible or not. Uh, decide what you're gonna do and then work backwards. Uh, and just sort of paraphrasing here a little bit, the theory should be simple, but not too simple. Uh, my opinion is that uh, too simple is never a problem because once it is so simple that you fully understand it, the greedy mind always adds complexity. And I think that the, uh, the only real problem is that it's not simple enough. Um, and then finally, there's a, a common advice also to sort of uh, do what you're good at, know your strength and, and play to it. And I think that's generally not the great advice. I think it's uh, decide to own the whole world. If you wanna uh, make a contribution, you wanna understand something, don't care where the methods come from, don't care what the disciplines are, don't care what the strength is, uh, just do it and you'll get strength. Um, all right, that's it. That's some acknowledgements here, but I, I, I was just asked last second to do this. I, uh, everything was a bit, I, I probably missed half the acknowledgements here, but yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Johan. That was a terrific talk. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Um, we have time for burning questions. Um, somebody wants to jump in. There's, oh, somebody else, go ahead. All right, go for it. Okay, um, I wanted to ask you about the transition between um, doing um, 
mostly theory of uh, mathematical biology uh, and the transition to doing experiments. Um, it's kind of, it relates to the um, last, um, last comment that you made, um, you know, just do what you want and, and uh, don't worry about um, uh, whether it's in your strengths or not. Um, I think a lot of people have this anxiety to move from doing theory or computation to experiments. And I wonder if you have any um, encouraging words for, for these kind of people, uh, early career people that may be, may be in the audience here. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did a little bit of experiments myself. Uh, and then I now I supervise experiments. I don't uh, run them myself anymore. But I'd say that I've had a number of mathematicians that came to my lab, many sort of pure mathematicians who want to come and do theorems. And then after a year, they, they want to try experiments. And at least three or four have gone from sort of pure theory, mathematical physics, uh, to become experimentalists. And I'd say that they, uh, sure, they have a lot to learn, but uh, they also bring something to the table that, that is uh, quite unique. And it's not just that they can write a model and then test the model. That's kind of, I'm not sure that really is, is such a big strength, actually, in the end. Uh, but they have a way of troubleshooting the experiments. If you've written a program, you know how to troubleshoot the, uh, the program. You don't go through line after line. And I've noticed many of the mathematicians are very, very good at that. Um, and they're very, very, um, very quantitative. So I'd say that there's these two types of mathematicians out there, the ones that are proud that they can't change the light bulb. Uh, and there's the ones that are sort of are build their little robots at home. Uh, so it depends on what kind of, uh, if you feel like you're not practical at all, uh, then maybe it's not a good idea. But you, if you're interested, I'd say that anxiety uh, has never advised anyone well. Um, <laughs> just try to ignore the anxiety uh, and just do it. It's not something you can do a little bit of uh, necessarily, but um, mm -hmm. I'd say that we used to have a rule in my lab that uh, every single person who did want to do theory had to sit down an experimental course, like one of these like Woods Hole courses uh, where they spend a number of weeks just doing uh, web work. And even the lab technicians used to set up a sit on a stochastic chemistry course, like for the mathematics, just to make sure everybody in the lab, uh, nobody in the lab should be allowed to say, oh, that's not my area, I don't really know it. Um, uh, and we, don't, we haven't done that so much the last few years maybe, but uh, I'd say it does work. And I think that, uh, yeah, I, I just, just say go for it. I don't think there's a problem. Uh, and it's a okay. much, much bigger contribution, not just on the, on the, on the experimental side, but just knowing, like when I, when I came from math department to biology department, ironically, all my math uh, went from having more specific models to just doing general theory, uh, rather than sort of most people who transition that direction where it becomes more realistic, more uh, so forth. And the main reason was that I realized that almost none of the methods work as advertised. And not just a little, a little <laughs> bit, but we lost maybe 10 man years studying spatial effects in biology until we realized that it was just the fluorescent proteins that were sticking to each other. Uh, and once you realize how incredibly bad the methods are for, uh, for many, many of these quantitative effects, uh, I think you start doing a, a different kind of theory, uh, one that doesn't necessarily rely on, on every detail being right and so forth. So. Um, Johan, I'm dying to ask a question, but in the interest of time, I will ask you offline. Uh, thank you again on behalf of the audience. Yeah, what a terrific talk and so many, uh, so many uh, gems for, uh, <laughs> for thinking about in future, um, we'll let you go and close the recording. Yeah.